All right, Kyle Carpenter is currently a freshman at the University of South Carolina. Before attending school, Kyle served over four years in the United States Marine Corps. During his second deployment with the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines in Afghanistan, what was it? Correct. Marja. Marja. Yep, down south. Um, Kyle sustained critical injuries after being hit by a hand grenade. For the last two and a half years of his time in the Marine Corps, Kyle spent it at Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland, which is widely known for specializing in the care, treatment, and rehabilitation of our nation's wounded warriors. While recovering, Kyle never stopped taking advantage of furthering his education. Kyle took classes between surgeries and during the end of his stay, <coughs> completed two internships, one with the CIA. Or is it different? Yeah, it's uh, pretty much the same thing. The, the Intelligence Agency, National Counterterrorism Center, and the other on Capitol Hill with the House of Veterans Affairs Committee under Florida Congressman Jeff Miller. After nearly 40 surgeries, years of physical therapy, and rehabilitation, Kyle has stayed steadfast in his goal to attend school for a degree in physical education. Um, we wanted to give you this stuff. Thank you very much. There's a hat, and there's also underneath here a uh, captain's band. We'd like for you to serve as honorary captain in our next game against New Mexico. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, that means a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Kyle Carpenter. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps in 2009. <clears throat> I graduated high school for, in 2008. Uh, I went to Paris Island, went to boot camp. I got done with boot camp uh, summer of 2009. I uh, did a short three-month deployment uh, down through the Caribbean to uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Cuba, to do some training. And uh, we worked a little bit with the Coast Guard and DEA, trying to track down some drug lords. Um, after that, uh, while we were on that uh, float with the Navy, uh, the president <coughs> decided to send a surge of 30,000 troops into Afghanistan. Um, and we knew that during that speech, listening to it on the, on the ship, we knew that if he gave the thumbs up, uh, that we were going to be one of the first units in line uh, into a region in Afghanistan that nobody had been in in a long time. So uh, he gave the thumbs up, and uh, we knew that was it, and time to train. The next seven months after we got off the ship, uh, we trained nonstop, day in and day out, to get ready for this deployment. Uh, we didn't know how bad it was going to be. <clears throat> uh, we knew it was going to be rough, but when we started seeing the unit that we were going to go over there and relieve, Coming back in wheelchairs with crutches, neck braces, we knew that uh, we knew that. I guess we had our work cut out for us. So, <clears throat> July of 2010, uh, myself and my buddies, my Marines, we got on a bus at a military base in North Carolina. And when we stepped on that bus, uh, you could not help but think, um, you know pretty good chance that this is the last time I'm going to be uh, on American soil. This is going to be the last time that I ever see my family alive. Uh, so we went over there. It's about a 10-day trip, uh, give or take, uh, a couple days to get to where you're going. Uh, you go through multiple countries, uh, multiple bases, multiple types of aircrafts, and uh, just little steps all along the way. And uh, on the 10th day that morning, we we're supposed to fly out at midnight. Um, over there, it's, it's preferable to fly at night to uh, work at night because uh, the chances of the enemy attacking you are much lower. So uh, we didn't get that flight at midnight. Uh, we went later that morning. Uh, we got on a helo. All the lights were off. Uh, it was around 5.30 a.m. Uh, we flew low and fast, and that uh, lowers your chances of getting shot down. So with all the lights off, the sun was s starting to come up, uh, and I got my first glimpse of Afghanistan. Looking out the back of that helicopter, uh, past our door gunner, um, all you see is patches of green farmland, rivers, canals, people walking around um, with donkeys, farm animals. It's a totally different world. They're, uh, they're stuck way, 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 way back in time. So um, 
looking out the back of that helicopter, again, the thought, the thought comes across, you know, am I going to lose my life in that field? Uh, am I going to lose a buddy down there? So um, we landed uh, and boots on the ground. Uh, the fighting started and it didn't stop the entire four months I was there. Uh, every morning our alarm clock was um, our base getting attacked, uh, Marines that were outside the wire, which is kind of our term for uh, our safety walls, our base, uh, whether it was our patrol getting attacked, uh, our base getting attacked, no matter what it was, every day uh, was, a, was a hard fight. Uh, fast forward four months, um, it's November 20th. We have, in the Marines, we, um, like I was introduced, we deploy with uh, battalions, which is a lot of Marines, but once you get over into a combat zone, you break into, um, depending on how bad the region is or how uh, spread out you want to be creating that Marine uh, American military presence. Uh, depending on that, <clears throat> just depends on, I guess, how many Marines you're going to be with. Uh, I was only with 40 to 45 Marines when we finally got to where we were going. Uh, we lived out of a, I guess you could envision a mud hut with no roof, just four high mud walls and a big square. And usually five to 15 family members would live in one. Uh, not many had shoes, sleep on the ground, live on the ground, and uh, that's their life. I mean, from the second you can walk, you're working in the fields with no shoes on, and you do that until, uh, until you're old and, and you pass. That's just the lifestyle over there. So November 20th, uh, my squad, which was only uh, roughly 9 to 12 Marines, that's who I operated with, my squad, the entire time I was over there. Uh, the platoon I was with, we were broken down into four squads. So we got tasked with a mission on November 20th to punch down about a click, uh, which is a kilometer, uh, not too far, but with the terrain over there as bad as it was, we didn't have vehicles, we did everything on foot. Uh, we carried all our weapons, all our ammo, food, uh, water, whatever we needed, we towed it with us. Uh, we got tasked with a mission to punch south and uh, into a very bad region. And anytime we had gone anywhere near this region or we had gone south at all, uh, it was hours upon hours of fighting just to get out of their life. So we knew it was going to be rough. Uh, didn't know how rough it was going to be. So, you know, we prepared. Uh, we packed bags. Um, we shoved as much uh, food, water, ammo, and uh, empty sandbags as we could in our packs. Sam, so, we stepped out of our base uh, early, late, late morning, early afternoon, and we started our journey down there. Uh, about halfway down, we started getting shot at, no surprise there, but our packs were so heavy, it was kind of like we just flopped over in the field and hope we didn't get shot. Um, they flood the fields over there during the day, so they know that we're on foot, and if you can imagine having uh, 100 pounds, maybe excess of 100 pounds on your back, and trying to walk through uh, mud where you sink ankle deep, it was, it was a task to get down there. Uh, luckily, we made it down uh, with no casualties. Uh, we kicked the family out because uh, of the location of this compound. We needed that one. Uh, we compensated the family. Uh, they moved out, and because of uh, combat and the war going on over there, a lot of compounds are abandoned, so they were able to move in one very close to the one that they were living in now. Uh, we took that over, and we immediately uh, started filling sandbags. That's what you want to do when you take over, especially a really small base where it's not many guys uh, in there, and you're kind of fighting it out until help and uh, supplies arrive. And that was pretty much our mission. I mean, for the four months we were there, because we hadn't been in the region, no troops really had been in the region for over 30 years, our job really was to go over there for seven months and pick as many fights as we could, uh, get rid of as many enemies as we could, and try to give the people over there uh, a better life um, than the living under the, the law of the Taliban, I guess you could say. 
So we take over this compound. Um, I would say 20 minutes uh, after taking it over. Uh, myself and my buddy, we were filling sandbags in the corner. And uh, what sandbags do is you fill them up with dirt uh, from the compound that you're in. You dig them and fill them up and you stack them. And what that does is that creates a barrier and sandbags are great for stopping bullets. Uh, taking a little bit of blast away if uh, unfortunately you're exposed to that. So sandbags really protect you. So that's kind of like our, our first line of defense over there. So my buddy and uh, me, just two of us, we were in the corner of the compound and we had started digging that hole to fill sandbags. And uh, the first attack came. And I remember my back was to the center of the compound where all my buddies were and uh, I heard this Grenades are extremely, extremely loud. And they're about the size of a baseball, maybe a little bit smaller. You would never think so, but uh, they are extremely loud. So uh, when one went off, what the Taliban like to do is their main choice of weapon is improvised explosive device. And really, they improvise with whatever they have. I mean, anything you can think of, they, they make bombs out of. Um, obviously to injure us and they'll uh, dig out holes in the walls for when we walk by. Um, they'll detonate them. Uh, the main, I guess, trigger that they use over there is pressure plate. So that's why most of the guys' injuries coming back are mostly double, uh, triple amputees because unfortunately we're just walking and it looks like a dirt road but you step on it and they have dug a bomb and put it in the ground and you trigger that and uh, that's, that's their main choice of weapon. So my first thought was uh, that they had IED'd the compound that we had moved into. And um, we use metal detectors and we sweep over there, but a lot of times they use styrofoam, wood, things that we can't pick up on. So when I heard it go off, uh, my immediate thought was that they had booby-trapped our compound. We had missed it, and uh, one of my buddies was gonna need some serious help. Uh, I turn around and uh, another one goes off in the exact same place that the first one did. So then my thought was maybe we're getting mortared. And mortars is you drop a, a charge down in a tube and, I mean, I'm sure most of you play Call of Duty, you drop a, a charge down in a tube, it goes off, it flies wherever you want it to, and uh, it lands and it obviously comes from the air. So whatever was blowing up our compound was coming from the air. We had not been exposed uh, to grenades the entire four, four months I was there. We had not heard of them being used. That was just kind of unheard of because the terrain over there is so open and really it's just farmland and rivers. It's more of uh, fighting our enemy across fields and, and longer distances instead of uh, maybe like Iraq when it's cities and, and very urban and, and you can get up close and personal like that. So we had never been exposed to grenades but my buddy he he yelled grenades when the third one went off and he, it was hard to comprehend but it kind of clicked and we all started to react uh, my my buddy who was kind of floating out in no man's land in the middle of the compound uh, obviously he wanted cover and to get cover he was running towards uh, part of the compound where over there they will have a giant square mud hut but in that, within that hut, they'll uh, build a roof and usually one of the corners of the compound. And uh, that's where they sleep and they pack in there at night. And uh, that's kind of how they keep warm. So my buddy was running to this uh, walled covered room. Um, and unfortunately he ran, as he was running, uh, gren another grenade came over the wall, landed. Um, it blew into his side. Uh, he kind of started stumbling. I saw him, he made it to the door and collapsed inside. And uh, you know, it clicks over there. You see one of your buddies get hit and uh, I took off after him. And <laughs> probably the fastest I've ever ran. Uh, I made it to that room and uh, I went in there and I held his head up and he was obviously in a, in a lot of pain and uh, bleeding. But uh, his lung had been punctured and uh, we had a corpsman there with us who's kind of like a medic and uh, we got him stable. Uh, while we were working on him, I noticed another one of my buddies had been injured in the same attack. So uh, we got them bandaged up, stable, uh, put them on a medevac helicopter and uh, they went off to the hospital. Both of them are fine now and uh, doing great. 
So later that afternoon, we steadily got attacked throughout the day sporadically. And uh, later that afternoon, I was on post. And post is, uh, I guess you would refer to it as kind of like a lookout. Uh, whenever you take somewhere over or whenever you're occupying somewhere, uh, Marines, we 100% of the time, every second of the day, every day of the year, we have somebody on a high position that can look out for the guys on the inside, make sure nobody gets too close to attack, throw grenades. And um, it was my turn for post. So I climbed up on the roof and uh, I've been at, on post uh, for a couple hours and um, I started getting shot at with a sniper rifle. And usually they're not too accurate, so I wasn't extremely worried. But uh, what they'll do over there is um, they will recruit fighters from other countries that aren't that don't favor the U.S. and they'll come actually and they'll flood into Afghanistan and they'll help them fight. And uh, a big group that they bring in is um, Chechnyans who can really uh, really knows how to use sniper sniper rifles. So I was on top of the roof and I started getting shot at. Um, after about 15 minutes of very accurate fire, I was fortunately I had built enough sandbags up on the roof that I uh, had enough room to lay behind. Uh, the rounds were so close that I could feel them uh, impacting the sandbags that I was laying behind. So after about 15, 20 minutes of getting shot at like that, uh, the Marine that was in charge of me came and told me to get off the roof. And uh, I jumped down. He said, well, it was a few hours until the sun was supposed to set. And like I said, they don't really mess with you too much at night. So we were going to finish it uh, when the sun went down and it got dark. We were going to finish building that post of sandbags for us to get behind. I jumped off the roof. And 40 seconds to a minute later, a rocket came in and totally vaporized that whole roof. So that was day one. Uh, the next day is November 21st. And uh, alarm clock, we were getting attacked, and uh, we went throughout the day filling sandbags, um, you know, really on high alert, obviously, from everything that had happened the past 24 hours. Um, mid afternoon, it was myself and my best friend, uh, it was our turn to take post. So we climbed up on the roof, and uh, I don't really remember too much, I guess, of the before events, before I was injured. Mainly, uh, I just remember how I felt after uh, I had been blown up. Um, really, I just remember myself and my buddy kind of joking around, laughing, um, laying on top of the roof. Um, and next thing I know, it felt like I got smacked in the face with a two by four. Uh, my vision totally went white, kind of looked like if your TV's on a station that doesn't really have cable, it's just kind of white static. It looked like that. Uh, my ears were ringing very, very loud. And uh, I was very confused because the last thing I remembered, I was on top of a roof. I wasn't walking around. I wasn't doing anything. Um, so it was hard for me to comprehend and try to connect the pieces in my head what really had happened. I knew I got blown up and been injured in Afghanistan, but I just couldn't think of why. Uh, I was fading very fast. Um, one of the last things I remember is, is feeling like warm water was being poured all over me from the blood that was coming out. Uh, I was very tired, just felt like I wanted to take a nap. And uh, my buddy kept telling me, you know, you're not going to die, you're not going to die. And uh, I kept arguing with him and said, hey man, listen, this is it, I'm going to die. And I had, I had briefly thought about it in my head. And uh, I knew and it had accepted that once I went unconscious, that was it. So, uh, you know, I thought of a few things. Um, you know, my family, obviously. Uh, I tried very briefly to uh, get right with uh, the man upstairs. And I went unconscious. And I thought that was it. And uh, a month to a month and a half later, it's all very blurred together. But. Uh, Minimum of a month later, I started to come out of my coma in ICU at uh, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, which is a big military hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, I spent a little over two and a half years there recovering. Um, I went through a little over 40 surgeries, um, therapy, 
you name it medically, and I probably went through it. But uh, I mean, that's that's my story. And uh, really, I mean, whenever the chance comes for me to speak to people, I, I usually um, like to end with really appreciate things. Um, I was really thinking like how I could uh, tailor my story to. Uh, you know, your awesome soccer team and, and your, uh, your, I guess, your guys that you have here in this room and, and the coach. I was really thinking about it, and I want to stick with really appreciate things because I really think that that really affects your life in all aspects, and uh, it not only helps you as a person, I believe, but as a player, and uh, just really appreciate that. You know, you have uh, nice cleats and nice, nice shoes on your feet, and and you can go to school and get an education, and you can you're afforded the opportunity to play soccer, and that you can come to practice and get better every day, and play under the lights, and you know, go into the bathroom and, and turn the faucet and get fresh, clean running water. I mean, we're extremely fortunate here, and. Um, you know, it's coaches out to tell you that you can push harder than you ever thought, and then you can, you know, achieve things physically that that you never thought were possible. So, I'll stay away from that. But um, really, just just in, enjoy your time here and, and just be glad for what you have. And that's that's really it. And I mean, uh, y'all can ask me any questions if you'd like. Nothing's out of bounds. And. Uh, about a year after I got out of the hospital, I met up with one of my buddies, and uh, he said he had a present to give me. And uh, I was not expecting this, but after I was hit, uh, my buddies actually went out and found the uh, ring from the grenade that was pulled and uh, thrown at me. So this is a whole reason <laughs> why all this happened. But uh, yeah, so any more questions? What was the like? Like, how long did it take you to be able to like, till you're like fully like functioning and walking and stuff like that? Um. Well, I'm still learning and still adapting and still working at a lot of things in life. I mean, uh, like I learned how to, because both my arms were severely damaged and this arm was a limb salvage and I only have really one nerve in it and uh, not many tendons and it doesn't do much. So uh, I really learned how to do a lot of stuff with my left hand because it was the better of my two arms. So I learned how to write with my left hand and then when this one got better, I learned how to write with this one. So now I write with this one, eat with this one. Uh, mainly tie my shoes with my left one. It's just like however, however you make it work, it works. And uh, as far as walking, um, that was a very slow and uh, nauseating process because after being one, totally still and for a month in ICU and your body doesn't move and your brain's so scrambled and, and trying to get a grasp on what's really going on and you're going through hallucinations and uh, all the medication they're pumping into you, your body really has a rough time, at least for me anyway, kind of getting back going. And I mean, for the first three weeks that I tried to do anything, uh, it was re like really bad, like uh, nausea, like throwing up. It was just really terrible to even do anything. So um, did two full months at, at uh, Walter Reed, and then I went to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, to a hospital there, and I spent two months there just doing the same thing, trying to get moving and get going, and um, all about the small goals. I know you said that um, you had the internships with the different companies, uh, and you're also a physical education major. Uh, What's your plans for the future? Um, well, probably the biggest part, I mean, besides my family and the people that supported me, one of the biggest factors in my recovery was when I got well enough, I was in the gym every day for hours on end. I would just go to the gym every single day because really once you get severely injured and, uh, you know, uh, when you're in the military, your job goes from being, 
uh, toting a machine gun, to just you're a patient and your job is to recover and get as well as you possibly can back to your new 100%. So being in the gym helped me tremendously physically, emotionally, mentally, and uh, you know I, I want a degree that is an absolute goal of mine which I, I want to achieve and will achieve, but uh, I do want that degree to back it up, but really I just want to be a personal trainer and I kind of want to pass that along to, uh, to other people, how much the gym helped me. Thanks for letting me come today, guys. I really appreciate it. I just want to say, because I know how these guys would feel about getting up in front of a group and talking, and how they would feel getting up in front of a group of strangers and talking. And for you to have gone through all the development that you have, and to have the poise, and to be able to speak as perfectly as you did in front of all these guys that you don't even know is absolutely astounding and thank uh, you, i really salute you you've done a great job so thank you i appreciate that thanks guys we look forward to having you out <laughs> absolutely.